Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Going behind the scenes with Hollywood's power players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Reba. Starts now. Hi. Welcome to Real Hollywood Live. I'm Ben. I'm Reba. And we're here every Tuesday on UBNRadio.com, Channel 1, at 1 p.m. Pacific Time on Tuesdays. And here we are. And do you know what day this is? Today is Tuesday. No, it's September 1st. What a scary thing. It's also Tuesday. It's always Tuesday with us. I know. I know. I wish they would change street cleaning to a different day. It'd be so much easier to park. <laughs> yes. Why would you want your life to be easy? I've always t- taken the more difficult path. I, you know, I, there's people who actually knew how to, like, take the easy path through life and live happily and easily and have great things, and I always found that really boring. I, but I never did it because I never, I never had the opportunity to, to have an easy road. Mm -hmm. especially in my career. And I know you didn't ask me about my career, but I'm going to tell you (laughs) about it anyway. But this past weekend, uh, Wes Craven died. I know. I was so bummed. I was hoping to have him as a juror on my Halloween Horror Fest. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before we talk about your Horror Fest... you've You've got a longer history with him. Well, I didn't exactly have a history with him. I had a history with his words... Because his words came out of um, Nightmare on Elm Street, one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And I was fortunate enough to work on three and four. And I just want to say this, they were the two top biggest ticket sellers, those two, the two I worked on. But I sat down with um, Robert England, and I did something I have never done in in my entire career, before and after, is that I interviewed him as Freddy Krueger. Because... Freddie was bigger than Robert. Not, not. I don't mean to get personal, but we talked about it before I did it. And I shot him with the lighting from the film. So I want you to see this moment with Robert England being Freddy Krueger talking about Wes Craven. Freddie came into my life at a convenient time came into what we call in the business a hiatus. And he fit perfectly into that. And I don't look for any omens <laughs> there. But it was a real neat fit. And it coincided and dovetailed so perfectly with this little gentle character that this wimp Robert was also portraying at the same time. And illuminated an entire dynamic of A to Z emotionally that that actor Robert England has that I believe that, I, that Freddie came, came into my life. I didn't come into his life. I believe that, that Wes Craven let him out of a cage somewhere, or this spirit out of a cage somewhere, and I walked into the, into the collided with those atoms, and uh, we've sort of, fortunately or unfortunately, been intertwined ever since. It's, it's so sad to hear of Wes Craven's passing, but hopefully what he created will inspire a new generation to take over the joy of scaring us. Well, if anybody's going to know that, if you're doing a scary film festival, Mm -hmm. you're seeing footage or films that are coming after Wes Craven. We are, and and we actually created, like a lot of our awards in the festival are by audience vote, but I created the Skin Crawler Award, which is kind of an internal jury selection, mostly by my acquisition committee. Because they watch thousands of films a year, and it's really hard to scare them. So if something makes their skin crawl, you know that's a winner. Well, I'm really glad that I got to show this this moment with Robert. I want to say that he really liked me because he invited me to his wedding reception. Wow. He was he was probably the only star that ever invited me to their wedding reception. But we had a we had a wonderful time uh, on those on those two films and I'm so glad that all my footage is now available through Media Mine. We got to see this. They have taken 23 years of my interviews, my behind the scenes footage. 
and some of my mistakes, because everything is in the footage, and they now have it all digitized for anybody to use or see. Well, that's great. Uh, you know, before we get in today, yeah. I'm really excited because we have continuing our great sponsor of Conundrum Wine, which I love, but there was one conundrum I had left, which was it kept getting warmer or colder. And so we have this incredible new sponsor, Rove Living. Oh, and I'm going to take advantage. This, of course, is a vacuum-sealed one that was made for coffee, but I'm going to put my wine into it <laughs> so that it keeps it at the perfect temperature all the time. And you, of course, are enjoying Ooh. the water, but thanks, That's Rove Living. That's interesting. Wait a minute. For conundrum. The, the container is warm. Yeah, it's like a vacuum. It's a and the water furnace. is perfectly chilled. Oh. Look at that. Well, you... <laughs> we are very lucky. We have very classy yeah. sponsors. It doesn't, doesn't sit quite as easily. Would you like Am me I... to tell you who's on the show today? You, know, yeah, you usually ask me, but I, I thought... Let's get into that. Okay, well, we're really honored who's in the show today because we're going to talk about a subject that is very close to my heart. I might have bastardized it when I was doing all those documentaries for the studios. They weren't really real, but they weren't making of, so I was trying to... I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker. Okay. Documentaries have come into the spotlight, and I think we owe a lot that the print media is going down. We used to get journalistic um, stories in print, in magazines, in, in newspapers, and it's just not happening because there's no money for print. And what has happened is that documentaries have come to the forefront. And I think it's come two ways. One, for somebody like you, Mr. Independent, mm -hmm. because independent films and documentaries seem to, to go hand in hand. But secondly, they tell the stories that there is no place to tell anymore. And we are so lucky because our guest today is Simon Kilmurray. He is the executive director, or I call him God, of the independent Documentary International. Association. International. Sorry. Yeah. They are, they are I look at him too. and it's always well. independent. Um, he, he is the executive director of the International Documentary Association. And man, does he know about documentaries because he came from point of view, POV on public broadcasting, which is still on and has been on. But I want to talk about Simon. Hello, Simon. I think before we... we're. I just want to ask, these are personal questions, okay. before we get to the midi gritty of, did you love movies growing up? First of all, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, <laughs> did I love movies? I did love movies growing up. It was, um, I grew up in Scotland, and um, I think one of the things that drew me to moving to New York was watching too many movies as a kid. Not necessarily documentaries, but watching everything from... You know, the screwball comedies of the 30s and 40s and 50s um, to early Scorsese. So is that where your fascination of storytelling, because it doesn't have to be a documentary, exactly. but storytelling is storytelling. Exactly. I totally agree. Um, documentaries are as rich in storytelling as anything. Uh, it's often richer because it's real. And you know, uh, I have yeah. to say this. I usually cannot understand a Scottish accent. <laughs> I mean, I have been in Scotland and I need an interpreter, but I understand you perfectly. So I've been here a long time. <laughs> it must be New York that's rubbed off. I couldn't believe that you would give up POV at the, as the top, I mean, on public broadcast, to come to Cal... Because you're not only giving up that, you're moving from New York to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Why did you... What was the... Enticement. I had the great honor and pleasure of um, being at POV for 16 years and seeing the series and the work grow enormously and being honored and watched by millions of people. Um, but I also think it's important that, uh, uh, that there's change, uh, that new people can come into that position as executive producer of one of the top documentary series and bring their own vision to it. Um, but I wanted to remain within the documentary field. It's what my passion is. And um, uh, the International Documentary Association is one of those leading organizations which supports filmmakers, and that's what I love to do. <laughs> and, and where do you see, like, as head of the IDA, because it all kind of falls a little bit there, the difference between, like, documentaries, agenda entries, or even reality TV? Well, certainly there's, there's a whole spectrum of work within the field. And I think... Um, 
uh, when you talk about agenda entries, I think that's a really interesting term. It's a new one for me, but certainly there's a lot of uh, films which are interested in 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 contemporary social issues mm -hmm. uh, and in advocating for s social change. Um, uh, so I think uh, what I'm interested in is what Reba was talking about is storytelling, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I want to be taken to places that challenge me that give me access to places which I wouldn't otherwise get access to. But wait a minute. You're doing this in a nonprofit world. Yeah. Do you wear kneecaps, knee pads? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been in the nonprofit world for a long time. I was with POV, and um, uh, that's the reality of this business. It's a bit of a hybrid. Um, some films will make money. Um, some films will need to be subsidized by philanthropic support. Um, but I still think they're very important stories that people will need access to. Do you I get I a lot? Wait, I, I, just I, I was going to say, I think most of the independent film industry is not for, not for profit, even if it's not quite their choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> and what happens when you get a no? Does it stop you or do you keep knocking on doors? I mean, I don't have the courage to, do, to go look for money and stuff. You keep knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and no is just another, uh, uh, another chance for you to come back and ask again. Well, one of the things, I don't know if you know this, but every year the IDA has a series where they take documentary filmmakers and help them qualify in L.A. and New York for the Oscars, which you vote for. Yes. And others. And if it wasn't for the IDA, these kids would never be able to have some of these great films really break out and be seen. Yeah, that was a series which IDA did for many years. It hasn't done it for a couple of years because mm -hmm. the qualification rules have changed, oh. which is fantastic for filmmakers. It's now easier for them to... To okay. qualify their it's films. that running. They have to get that ex run for a week. Yeah, in, well, the, the, in the, New York or LA. Yeah. Look, yeah. I happen to be an Oscar voter, and I got to tell you something. I have to read each year what the new rules are because yeah. they do keep changing yeah. them. I don't think they're always fair. But so, so would you say, Simon, that uh, have people become more interesting, or have documentaries just become more accessible to people? I think um, documentaries have become more accessible to people. I think people have always been interesting. I think real people's stories are always interesting. Um, but uh, but I, th I think certainly the, the art and craft of filmmaking is something that um, uh, you're seeing being explored in documentary filmmaking uh, to a much greater extent. It's no longer either the voice of God narration mm -hmm. um, or the shaky handheld you know, camera chasing someone down the street. And I think you're seeing all of the tools of filmmaking being applied to documentary. Mm -hmm. mm. Have documentaries changed? And I really want to talk about documentaries coming from outside of the United States. Have you seen, because I've seen a change in the foreign films. Now, I'm not, a, I'm on the foreign film committee, but I don't, I, I don't have the stamina for the documentary. Now, it's not personal. It's, you have to be a documentary maker to even qualify to be on that committee. So have you seen a change in, in style? In I, I think um, less of a change in style and more of an openness on the part of audiences to embrace a range of styles. I think there is um, there are certain films which have a more um, European aesthetic or, or that have an aesthetic which is particular to the region from which they come. Um, I think what's interesting is now that um, uh, audiences around the world have more ex access to those stories and and embrace those different approaches uh, more enthusiastically than I think they did previously. Mm -hmm. well, I, I'm fascinated by documentaries. I think I like the idea that, and I can only go by the documentaries that at least I've seen at the Academy, you know, or the Oscar nominated. I, I can still remember last year, um, Rory. Kennedy's documentary about the last days in Vietnam mm -hmm. absolutely blew me away. And I wonder, when you deal with all these documentary makers, where in the world do they get footage? That, I think, is one of the great gifts of being a good filmmaker. And it's also a great gift that filmmakers give to our culture um, because they are, in essence, building a historical archive that will live on beyond their films. Um, so Rory, uh, in the last days of Vietnam, was talking to all these service members who were there and, and, um, uh, and family members who were there experiencing these tumultuous events. And buried in their basements and in their attics was 
home movie footage that had never been seen. <laughs> and I think that's a great gift that she's given us, is another, um, not only a wonderful film, but then a, a, a whole other layer to the, the Vietnam story, which is was really unknown before she made this film. Yeah, I had I, I just could not believe the footage when I saw it. Can I just switch gears for a second? We can always come back to documentaries. But I know that you do a lot of panels and, mm-hmm. and you're a judge on juries and that you were at Cannes. Did you do the I you, wasn't at Cannes this year. I've, but you uh, have but I've, been. I've been on a lot of juries and uh, different festivals around the world. Yeah. Well, I, I worked the Cannes Film Festival and I nearly died because I was so tired and I did 55 interviews. So what I want to know is when you do a festival, whether it's Cannes or it doesn't matter which one, mm-hmm. what is it like for you? You're a judge. They carry you around they party oh. you powder you what do they do D- for different you? festivals have different resources well, take the but, rich uh, ones so we can but hear what yeah you, you know i've been you know on, on tribeca and a few other kind of high high-end festival juries and and they treat you very well um but i love it because i get a chance to sit and watch and talk about movies and that's what i really enjoy and i get to meet filmmakers and i get to meet uh, hear interesting opinions of other people in the jury and i think that's that's I take it very seriously because a lot of blood, sweat, and tears goes, in, goes into making these films, and I, I want to watch them and watch them and really give them due consideration. Did you ever think of getting your hands dirty? Maybe that's the wrong way to... And actually making a documentary yourself. You've executive produced, but I know about executive producers. They're the people that find the money. Yeah. How about going in the trenches? I think at some point I would consider it. Um, uh, I, I'm not ready for that yet. It's a it's a tough business. What would, uh, but wait a I, minute. What would it take? Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Is there a subject you've come across that's just burning in you that has to be told? You know, I I think maybe I found my calling uh, both at POV and IDA because I can help those people who have that burning passion uh, realize it. And that's what I'm good at. Uh, I think once I find that subject which drives me forward um that really gnaws at me um i will i'll follow it but uh so far it's been me helping those people who have that well and and then just kind of a follow-up because this is where you know in my business life i've worked very hard to champion how to connect those films with audiences because that's the next step after they overcome the obstacle of being made how is the ida able to help filmmakers then reach the audience well, I think or, being or you are, or you yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think being part of the idea, and it's not just me; it's my colleagues also. Yeah. It helps give access to a network of other makers, mm-hmm. but also people who are in the industry more broadly, whether it's broadcasters, cinema distributors, sales agents, international film festivals. And I think having it's it's as we all know, uh, you know, a lot of it's talent, but a lot of it's also networking and 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 finding the right people at the right time. Um, so we're able to help build those networks. Do they sell documentaries like they sell films? Yeah. 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 And I've certainly been part of helping make those deals. So do documentary filmmakers go like to AFI, uh, to American Film Market? And they'll go to AFM or they'll go to Sundance to be sold or they'll go to MIPCOM and Cannes to be sold. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of them, like at least the ones I've worked on, tended to be more in the broadcast hour. So they were being made for a TV broadcast and then... You know, the Internet's now become a great equalizer because they weren't necessarily feature length or right. they were a little contrived to become. Right. So right. there's a lot of places for documentaries. There's a lot of places. There's a lot more places for documentaries than there were, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And what about storytelling? Has that changed? I, 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 I you know, the technology has changed. Mm-hmm. Um I hate to say this, but with reality television, everybody's airing their dirty linen Mm -hmm. all over television. Has that affected documentaries where people are willing, especially famous people, are willing to reveal more about themselves? I'm thinking the question about the three documentaries that I saw, the one on Amy Winehouse, the one on Nina Simone, and the one on Marlon Brando, and they had stuff in there that the public had never heard. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's that's part of the history of documentary film. If you go back all the way to the 1970s to An American Family, which was a PBS oh, okay. series, 
probably one of the first reality doc series on television about the Lord family. Followed them, I think, for several months. And you saw that family opening up. Or you, or you look at a series like the 7-Up series by Michael Apted, which has now been following from 7, 14, 21, all the way up to 56 years old every seven years. You know, there is a history uh, of, of filmmakers insinuating themselves into their characters' lives. I think one of the differences between documentary and reality television is are some of the motivations behind that. I think um, uh, whether it's a, um, a, 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 a film which is, an, uh, you know, trying to tell someone's story um, from a perspective that is human, that is uh, empathetic, um, or whether it's uh, an entertainment, uh, purely an entertainment. And I think, you know, you, 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 you spoke about the Amy film. There are many ways to make that film. I think what the filmmaker did so well was reveal the pain and complexity behind a story that we thought we know. Speaking of that particular one, um, when a documentary filmmaker makes a film about a famous person and their family... What kind of legal um, recourse does the family have <laughs> when they don't like it? Because her father, Amy Winehouse's father, comes out as a fool mm -hmm. in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Can he do anything? Are documentary filmmakers protected somewhere? Well, I think documentary filmmakers don't fully have the protection that journalists do. And I think that's one of the challenges. That's one of the things that IDA will be taking on as an advocacy organization is... Uh, is making sure documentary filmmakers have adequate legal protections, um, but a, a lot that your answer will depend on jurisdiction. Also, it's, it's much tougher in Britain for filmmakers because the libel laws are not are are are, are, are weighted more. Wait a minute. He didn't open his mouth. What he did, you saw. Yeah. Okay, he didn't say. Anything. He brought a filmmaker down yeah. to watch his daughter disintegrate. I mean, he, yeah. the father did that. Yeah. I don't know. How can you call that libel when he was the instigator of it? Well, it depends how it's portrayed. I think I think totally in that film, you're absolutely right. That there is nothing that the, the filmmaker needs to be concerned about. All I'm saying is that in, in different jurisdictions, the, 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 the rules are different and it's mm. a little tougher in the UK. Um, but I think we recently published an article um, about fairness versus balance. And I think people confuse balance as... You have 50% of one thing, therefore you have to have 50% of the other thing. I think really the question that should be asked is, what's fair? Um, is, is that portrayal of Amy Winehouse's father fair, given the context of the larger okay. story? And You're I think the expert. That, and I, and I, was it I fair? Think, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's important that you're both, that it's honest. And also, like what I used yeah, to tell, yeah, but it depends but, on who thinks yeah, they're no, honest. But, but no, what I used to tell tell like my subjects was, I will not take anything out of context. Yeah. But if you hang yourself out to dry, then that's on you. I think, and I I'm think, not going to tell you that I'm going to take that out. I'm going to present what you present to us. I think that, that I think that is being fair. Absolutely, mm -hmm. I think that is being fair with your with your subject matter. Yeah. I have to ask you. You're so serious. What do you do for fun? <laughs> I mean, this is our reality show. Yeah. Simon Kilmurray, what is your idea of fun? <laughs> I do watch a lot of movies, and I do it for fun, and I love it. I'm very, very lucky. I get to see a lot of films, most of them docs. But, I, I, you know, for me, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. I just moved to L.A., so I'm brand new to town. So I'm, learning, I'm exploring the city for the first time, um, a city which I visited many times but never really felt I knew. Uh, and I'm exploring the hikes and the beaches, and it's just a fantastic place. So I'm spending a lot are of time Are you exploring. feeling a cultural shock? I mean, we are not New York. Yeah, <laughs> definitely not New York. And, and, and um, uh, But it's fantastic. It's a, great, it's a great time. I'm really enjoying it. And what about, what I, I just have to ask this, because people in New York can pick up the phone and get food delivered. And I don't know how much we do this here. We're getting better at uh -huh. it. Is that was that a big shock to you that you couldn't just get food delivered? Oh, I and can in my neighborhood. I can. Oh, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did that why you picked it so you'd feel a little? I, connected I wanted to, to be York? able to walk around a little bit, and yes, that's why one reason why I picked it. Yeah. So, what do we have to look? If we're in the beginning of award season. You know how I know? A screening last night with a party. A screening tonight. Uh, I also got my first screener, which 
just shocked me because mm-hmm. this was last was in August that I got a screener. What can we look forward to? Do you think in this award season? I think this has been. I've been in the documentary business for a long time. I think this is an absolute standout year for films. I think there are so many great films that have been out, and I know the films that are coming out over the next couple of months. Uh, so I think you can look forward to... IDA has a screening series, which is starting in uh, actually later this month, in September, I think on the 17th. And we're going to be screening some of the best films of the year. There's going to be about 20 films that are screened at the Landmark Theater, and they're free. So I encourage people to go to, ID, to documentary.org for that screening series schedule. Well, thank you so much. We're going to cut to a small break to hear from our sponsors, Conundrum and Rove Living. And then we'll be back after that with Kat Kramer. Kat Kramer and Simon will be back later. We're not letting him leave. Here's our commercial break. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine. Find your adventure. Rove knows you're always on the go, so we make it easy to have the most basic luxuries at your fingertips no matter where you are. At home watching a movie, working out at the gym, or running around town. Yes, we are talking about having hot coffee and cold water available on demand. Rove makes everything better. Check out roveliving.com. That's R-O-V-E living.com. Rove, make life better. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Growing up in Hollywood as the daughter of an award-winning producer-director, Stanley Kramer, who, by the way, won 16 Oscars. I'm an Oscar voter. I don't know anybody's won 16 Oscars in their lifetime. And the goddaughter of Katherine Hepburn. Katherine Kramer, known what it was really like, what Hollywood was like when she grew up. And I hope she'll tell us some of the stories. And I know you want to be called Cat. Yes. But yeah. I just finished Catherine Hepburn's book. I mean, I didn't know you were going to be on the show, and I was <laughs> reading the book. Okay. And I know how much she loved your father. I guess, really, he must have loved her because uh, you got that name. But maybe tell me some of the things you remember about your father and growing up in Hollywood. Well, um, it's amazing. I, cheers. Wait, oh. but you... Oh, Wait. Yeah, we got to welcome you properly. Yes, welcome. Oh, welcome. Simon, get yours Great. up too. Okay, cheers, cheers to everybody. Cheers to everyone. Mm. Um, the interesting thing is, um, I was named for Catherine Hepburn. She was my godmother and namesake, as I'm named after her. And you asked about why I go by Cat. She used to write me notes from Auntie Cat. So a lot of people, you know, that were close friends of hers knew her as Kate Hepburn or Kate. But really close friends and family uh, knew her as Cat, and so that's probably why I adopted the name Cat, just because I'm a performer, and I just thought Catherine is such an amazing name, so strong, and it's you know in honor of her. But she sent my parents a christening dress when I was born, saying she will forever be telling them spell it with an A. Probably said spell it with an A. <laughs> and you know I have a character in my one woman show called Auntie Kate, who's the alter ego of of me in the show, and it's based on her. So 
That's another reason why she went by Cat is because they were always misspelling her name and they always misspell mine. So I just I go by I'm I'm I go by both, but primarily Cat. So what was Hollywood like growing up? Well, the interesting thing is um, my parents moved my sister and me away from Hollywood growing up. We actually grew up in Seattle, Washington, because they wanted us to have, quote, unquote, a normal upbringing, and um, also New York. And what they didn't know when they moved me up there, first of all, was that, because I always wanted to be in show business. Supposedly, I, I came out of my mother's womb looking for my Klieg light, and I was a dancer and a singer even from, like, the age of three. I just went for it, and... They try. My dad was like really protective, shield her away from Hollywood, and you know. And I think they were very smart because Seattle's very, if anything, uh, it's anti Hollywood. It's very much like um, you know other cities and other uh, like Chicago and uh, San Francisco. But culturally, it's way ahead of the curve. So next to New York, Seattle has the most theaters. So I actually went right for it. I it, he didn't keep me out of show business. If anything, my parents brought me into it by moving me up there because I was like the child actress in all the shows there and I did live performing. So I had a huge background in theater and live performing all um, my life. Did, did, did your dad ever direct the school play? No, <laughs> so but you know, it's funny you mentioned that because um, there is a memory I have to share that I've never shared. Actually, bef um, when I was very little, um, I fell in love with, I guess, uh, Bugsy Malone or something. And that movie... Uh, or kids played gangsters. And so I decided to put on a show in the backyard. I started doing that too. Besides working professionally, I was always putting on shows. And we did like Bugsy Malone. My sister was in it. And my dad and mom invited all the neighbors. And um, yeah, my dad was, I think he produced it and helped direct it. So yeah, that's, that's as close as we get to a school play with him. But you came from a really famous family. And I'm wondering in the lore of show business, did it open doors or did it make it harder? I think both. Um, I always say there's pros and cons because the pros are, you know, it, it does open doors just out of curiosity. And I think that people are curious to see, you know, if you're, you know, the daughter of somebody or the son of someone, what you have to offer, or, you know, what maybe what you can do for them, unfortunately. So they let you in the door, but you still have to prove yourself. But I found that it's been a con in some ways because... Um, they expect that I've had it easy, that I've never had to earn this stuff on my own. And, and my dad was never big on nepotism. He really wanted me to carve my own niche. He influenced me, and my mom influences me, but both of them are looking for me to find my own creativity. So, you know, even with my cinema series, which was created out of his legacy, it's still my own thing that I've created on my own. I got to ask, wait, well, this is a frivol frivolous question. <laughs> She's the only one I've ever got a chance to ask. Tell me what it's like being Miss Golden Globe, because oh, that, is a, that is a <laughs> so nepotism job. Speaking of the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> that a, is one thing where um, you have to be, you have to be the, the daughter and now son. They actually have Mr. Golden Globes now. But it started out with you have to be the daughter of somebody in the industry, preferably Golden Globe winners or people, you know, ones that have been celebrated. And um, I join a lo long list of ones that have gone on, like Laura Dern, Melanie Griffith. There's been a lot of Miss Golden Globes before me, and it was a big honor for me to do it, mainly because what a lot of people don't know is that my father actually helped start the Hollywood Foreign Press. So... Mm -hmm. He, you know, he was involved with the early formations of it, even though he was a filmmaker. He was honored a lot by them, and he came up with an idea to have the Golden Globes way back when it was first starting. So that gave me, like, a tradition, just, just it's a nostalgic tradition. And my mother, actress Karen Sharp, now Karen Sharp Kramer, but as an actress she was known as Karen Sharp, she won a Golden Globe for The High and the Mighty back in the 50s. So... That was for us as like a Golden Globe family because I have that tradition. And I, I've been the one Miss Golden Globe that's carried on the tradition. I've tried to go back every year. I don't think I've missed that many. And they even had me coach a couple of the, um, when they had a Mr. Golden Globe, they asked me to come down and give him some tips. And they've interviewed me like a lot in articles about what would you tell this year's Miss Golden Globe? Or I think one year they even had a Mr. and Miss and, and I had to give them tips. So... For me, asking that question resonates because I've really kept it as a tradition, 
And a lot of the um, ones that have done it, they just do it that one time. They don't care that much. But I've really tried to make it um, something that's an honor. And now they have a party just to announce whoever the Miss Golden Globe or Mr. Golden Globe is going to be. I know we said that today is September 1st, but it's also Lily Tomlin's birthday. Yes. And I'm wondering, because you were so generous to send us some footage, if Kurt would play a little tiny clip of you and Lily Tomlin. Ooh, Lily, you've got that fire. I'll never tire. Will always admire how you got to be, how you gotta be. You. Hat. And this is what fascinates me, especially having Simon Kilmurray here, is that you produce films called Films That Change the World. And I know that you have a film coming up that really plays off of one of your father's most famous films um, on the well, beach. Oh, yes. Well, actually, um, to backtrack, yes, it's Lily's birthday. It's also my parents' wedding anniversary. So... Um, that bonds me to Lily automatically. But I started working with her on uh, a documentary about elephants. We both advocate for elephants. This was a film that was already finished, and I debuted it for my series, Films That Changed the World, which you just mentioned, which is actually right here on the lot um, where we are. So it, the tradition is because my dad's uh, theater is here, and this cinema series came off of that, where I present socially conscious documentaries and films, but primarily documentaries. And the one you're referring to is Fallout. Um, I actually had that for my fifth anniversary that Lily hosted, because she's sort of like the ambassador to my series. She's done more, more documentary um, events with me than any of the other celebrity activists. She's narrated one of them. She's actually in one of the ones coming up. And in this particular case, uh, Fallout is about the making of On the Beach, in Melbourne, Australia, it was about Neville Shute's novel about the end of the world, nuclear holocaust, and how my dad adapted that for the screen. And Dr. Helen Caldicott, who I'm sure you know who she is, a leading authority, um, on the beach, the book and the film had changed her life when she first saw the film and when she read the book. That's a, how she became who she is. And Lily is a longtime friend of hers, so she not only hosted the premiere, but she introduced Helen, who was the keynote speaker. But there is another documentary that I'm about to present that also has some of my father's films in it. So that's an example of me kind of bridging the gap um, between you know current documentaries that have social issues. And because he made so many socially groundbreaking films, a lot of times he's represented in these documentaries. And that one is Cinemability, Jenny Gold's film. And it traces the history of uh, how characters with disabilities are portrayed in the media, film and television, and two of his films are in that. Um, Ship of Fools, which is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, and um, The Men, which was Marlon Brando's debut, where he played a paraplegic. Well, and, and you don't know this, but Kat and I have a connection. The director of Fallout, yes. Lawrence Johnston, also directed a documentary that we distribute called Night, right. and she was at our premiere of it. Uh, I was just about to say that uh, Lawrence Johnson is an amazing Australian filmmaker, yeah. and Night is a film, that's where we first met, right. that he premiered right, you know, a, a few months before Fallout. Mm -hmm. And Fallout had already opened in Australia, but I had the North American premiere. And I had a, I moderate all the panels for my series. It was a uh, power panel. Lily was on it. She's been on like all my power panels. Um, and we had a lot of activists and, and not only people from the film, but, you know, like Lou Gossett Jr., who's a, an activist and he, and he pioneers a lot of these issues that people don't know about. Rick O'Berry, who was the subject of The Cove. And The Cove was one of the documentaries I had that really, really helped focus my series as 
like a leading uh, think tank panel for documentaries. Well, we just heard you sing, and I saw this <laughs> footage. What is it with you and Mick Jagger? Come on. Uh, this was the funniest thing I have ever seen. Where did this idea come from? You're talking about my um, my little trailer for yeah. my duet with Mick? Yes. Yeah, that's a passion project, and I'm still working on it. Um, I have a one-woman show called My Duet with Mick, which is a solo show uh, about my journey trying to get Mick Jagger to sing a duet with me on my CD, which I've already recorded, uh, and I've left you know, a spot there for two more tracks, of his solo material. Because I think as a songwriter... On his own, you know, he's great, obviously, with the Stones and with Keith. And there's a few Stones uh, songs on there. It's called Gemstone because it's very rare cuts. But I've reimagined his solo material because those albums I thought were so great. And, you know, Mick wrote the music and the lyrics, the bulk of them himself, and they were never recognized. And I thought, you know, I would like to take these, especially the love songs, and sing them from a, a woman's point of view and reinvent the songs. And since nobody knows them... They're almost like brand new songs. So I have a web series that goes with it. So it's like a three-part project. All called, my, well, the web series in the show is called My Duet with Mick. And the CD is called Gemstone, Cat Creamer Sings Mick Jagger. Now, has he heard about, the, has oh, the message I, gotten I know he him? knows, but <laughs> so I it's don't. So it's I, not quite like my date with Drew where he's called yes, up yet to is. say? Yes, it, it is. exactly like, okay. it's funny that you mention that because I was already working on the idea and I recorded a lot of the material. And then when my date with Drew came out, I said, I'll just do like the sequel to this because okay. that was exactly what I was trying to do. And I, I even talked to Brian Hertzlinger, who made the film, and mm -hmm. was trying to get him. But we were trying to do like a reality show thing where everybody would have a goal and they'd be like a different one each week. So I'm kind of like, there hasn't been a follow up. So in a way, I'm kind of the follow up to that. And Drew Barrymore was wearing a stone shirt in when she actually meets him in it. And okay. I thought, my God, it's like carrying it on. So, yeah, it's very much She's like that. Get and Mick Jagger. What, he doesn't know it that's, yet. That's which... right. And, and I don't want to know him too well now because it won't pay off to get him when I finally do. But my solo show is a whole different thing, and that's still in development. I, I debuted part of it last year, around this time, actually, September 5th. And now I'm retooling it for the full-length version, which will be unleashed, you know, whenever I'm ready with it. All right. Well, so. I think we're going to take a break, and then you and Simon can talk together, and we're going to have her sing. She doesn't know oh, this yet. God, oh, I'm God, I'm going to do it to her. We're going to take a break <laughs> with our wonderful sponsors. You know who yeah. they are. Absolutely. Conundrum Wine and Rove Living. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine. Find your adventure. Rove knows you're always on the go, so we make it easy to have the most basic luxuries at your fingertips no matter where you are. At home watching a movie, working out at the gym, or running around town. Yes, we are talking about having hot coffee and cold water available on demand. Rove makes everything better. Check out roveliving.com. That's R-O-V-E living.com. Rove, make life better. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. Before I introduce 
Kat Kramer as Katherine Hepburn. I want to impose on both my guests, you don't even know this, that we're going to show a tiny clip of a question I asked Cher. Now, this was a long time ago. This was for the movie Mask. She had not been nominated yet. This was the a studio push for a nomination. And the question was, do you consider yourself a risk taker? We'll run that, and then we'll come back with Katherine Kramer and Simon Kilmurray. Are you a risk taker? I think so. You don't, it's like, in this career, I don't think I've been a risk taker because when you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. You know, I didn't have anything. People already didn't think I was talented. They just thought I wasn't. So that, you know, all I could do was either confirm their feelings or change their minds. Well, we're back. And, and it is a question I'm going to ask both of you. But first, if I have a performer in the room, we're going to ask her to perform. Well, and... Since she's going to do it not as Kat Kramer, but as Katherine Hepburn. Simon, could you play Mick Jagger? Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I have a Scottish accent, well, not, not an English one. <laughs> oh, okay, fine. Well, I guess, I guess we'll go with Katherine Hepburn then. Okay, Catherine you Hepburn. Do satisfaction or? Well, I thought you'd give us a few bars from Bless the Beast okay, and the Children. Okay, okay. From your father's film. Okay, gosh, this is never had. This is a first, everyone. I've never done this as Auntie Kate. Um, okay. Um, Bless the beast and the children. Oh, gosh. Um, for in this world, they have no voice. They have no choice. <laughs> you are Yay. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. The, I, I know. She's never, she would kill me if she was here. Well, right she's now. dead. It's she okay. She can do anything she wants. <laughs> so here's the question. And I'll start with the lady first, Simon. Are you a risk taker? Oh, I'm an Aries, and so yes, I'm a risk taker, definitely. And how many times have you been burned as a risk taker? All the time. I, I don't know uh, any time that you take a risk that you don't stand the chance to get burned. And how do you pull out of it? Faith and um, just believing in my mission and just not letting anyone, no naysayers talk me out of what I know is right. Woo. Okay, Simon, it's your turn. Are you a risk taker? Yes, I think I am. I moved to the States from Scotland without knowing many people, without knowing what I was going to do. Well, I was going to ask you, how in the world, first of all, I don't think they could have understood you when you first moved here, but that's another story. How did you get a job in New York? I was lucky. I, I, I met some people who uh, kind of took me under their wing, but I think that's one of the, the great things about coming here is um, uh, a the, there, there are many more opportunities that, op that opened up for me in the United States than I would ever see back in the UK. And I think that's, that's still true for people coming here. Mm. And, I, and I want to ask you, have you been burned at being a risk taker? I don't think I have. I think on balance, I have really benefited from, from the risks I've taken. I've been very, very fortunate. Okay, so now I'm going to do it to well, I, I, you. Know, I, I eat <laughs> protein him. bars past their best buy date. <laughs> Sometimes it always doesn't go so well. Now, am I a risk taker? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what did you do when you get burned? I pick myself back up and I go again. Okay. And, and, and yes. I learn. It's like I don't do the I don't bang my head against the wall over and over and expect this, a different result. Ooh, were you in a twelve step program? That's no, I was like a figure skater. Oh, okay. Well, I fell down ten thousand times. I was a I'm a risk taker. I, I still am. I know we I've read your book. <laughs> And when I got burned, um, I learned to lie. It, was, it came in very handy in Hollywood. And I say this because you're a beautiful woman. And um, women have a tendency in Hollywood to be judged by their age. So when I came up, I decided I would just start over again and be 40 one more time. <laughs> so I did celebrate my 40th birthday twice. Once when I was really 40 and once when I was really 50. So that I... But it, what it did is it bought me the career of a lifetime that I always wanted. And so I don't apologize for being a liar. But I think it takes a special kind of person to be a risk taker. Because failure is always hanging over our heads. What I, think, I, I think the greatest achievements, though, have come from taking risk. You agree? Yeah, my dad was a risk taker. My godmother 
even my mom. I, yeah, I, I come from a family of risk takers. So it is in the blood. As a performer, you lay yourself open to being hurt every single time you go on an audition or step on stage, and that's, and you have to pick yeah. yourself up for better or for worse yeah, every I, single time. You have to be fearless, you know, yeah. and uh, really believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. well, and I, I think also with documentary filmmakers, for the most part, they don't know where their stories are going to go. They're taking a risk every time they pick up the camera and start following someone. Are they going to have a real film there? And I think that's an enormous leap not, of not faith. Only, not only that, like I can tell you as the filmmaker that I had to lay my credibility on the line with every single subject to get them to open up, and I had to build that relationship. And sometimes based on how the film turned out, I knew what that, the pain that that was going to cause, to be honest about what the film was. Yeah. The pain to you or to... To both of, to both of us, because we had built a bond and a trust and a relationship, and then what they said and what came out I knew wasn't going to paint them favorably, but it wasn't my position to do a snow job and to promote them. It was to tell the story. Well, I, I just want to ask you this. As the executive producer of an awful lot of point of views, how do you tell your, produ your director, who really is the one that makes the documentary, that it's not working? <laughs> that can be a very hard conversation, but it's certainly one I've had over the years. Um, uh, I, I find the best way to do it is to be as honest as possible. I don't try and be cruel or to be uh, um, hurtful, but to give my honest assessment of a film and, and to give it the context and the knowledge that people have sunk on an awful lot of time and effort into the work. And that sometimes that just isn't going to pay off in mm. this particular time. But that shouldn't stop them from trying again. Well, i got to tell you something. It has absolutely killed me, but we've run out of time. Uh, we want to propose a toast to the most amazing guests, to Simon and Kat. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you yeah. Cheers. 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 Again, thank you to our sponsors, Conundrum Wine, Wagner Family of Wines, and RoveLiving.com. And join us next week. We have another very exciting uh, time. We'll be here next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific time on UBNRadio.com. During the week, you can watch this show and others from the past at RealHollywoodLive.com. Find out everything. And next week, we're going to be talking with here, two I... wonderful people, Swedish actress Natalie Soderquist, who is in Miss Julie, which... Uh, will be premiering on Film Festival Flicks uh, coming soon, as well as actress Maggie Wagner. So this is where you get to say? Yes, I get to say that's a wrap. We'll see you next week. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and Reba.